The new Santa Cruz is exactly the kind of ute that America has needed. But whether it's the one that we've wanted is what I'm going to try to find out today. fun, detailed car content without fluff, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. There are varying perspectives when it comes to what people consider as a truck. For some, if it doesn't have an eight foot bed, then you can just get out. For others, if it just has a body on frame construction, you're good. And Hyundai seems to agree with that as they don't call the unibody Santa Cruz a truck. Using the term sport adventure vehicle and listing it under SUV on their website. All of the information that I will be providing today is for the 2023. And while there are no mechanical changes, there are a couple little tweaks to the trims and packaging that are worthy to note. But first, let me get you familiar with the configurations. You're gonna have four major trims. That's the SE, SEL, SEL Premium, and limited. Now the changes for 2023 include standard blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert for the SE trim. We'll also get the larger touchscreen on the SEL premium now, along with Hyundai's more advanced stop and go adaptive cruise control. There's also going to be a new night edition. It'll have some dark accents, big 20 inch wheels and side steps. It appears to be based on the SEL activity package, but with the turbo engine I'll talk about soon. This does look neat, but I'd love to see a more dedicated off-road spec akin to the new Ford Maverick Tremor, or at least something more substantial than the XRT Tucson, which is the outdoorsy SUV equivalent of a mall cop. And if you want a real deal, consider checking out Royal on the East Side in Bloomington, Indiana. The staff are friendly and knowledgeable. Their new inventory is sold without a markup, and they have an interesting set of used cars too. Check them out. Unfortunately, you do still get halogen headlights unless you step up to the SEL Premium. At least all of them do get LED daytime running lights, which have a distinctively fresh Hyundai look. This is all subjective, but I think the brand has some of the most original style among crossovers, especially when we consider the Genesis brand, but let me know what you guys think. When it comes to powertrains, they have a choice of 2.5 liter engines one naturally aspirated, and one turbocharged. The NA variant will make about 191 horsepower, whereas the 2.5 liter turbocharged model makes about 281 horsepower, 311 pound-feet of torque, making for a very potent ride. In order to get the turbo, you have to go with the SEL Premium or Limited. The lower trims will just get the standard 2.5 liter unit. Those lower specs will also just get a traditional torque converted eight speed automatic, whereas this gets a eight speed dual clutch. And I know what you're thinking, Hyundai really doesn't have a great history when it comes to dual clutches, whether that's the class action lawsuit against the seven speed or it's slightly toxic tendency to overheat when things get hairy off road. And while I can't speak too much about the eight speed dual clutches longevity, I will say that this is now a wet clutch versus the dry clutch of the previous car, which will improve the thermals. And as a result, I haven't heard of reports saying this is overheating off-road. Something else that may help in some more remote tricky situations would be a 360 view camera system, but this will only get that if you go with the limited trim. Another pro to this turbo dual clutch setup is that it actually still runs on regular gasoline. So with that in mind, I wanna see what it can do from zero to 60. For this test, AC is off. We have traction control, stability control off. It does shift very fast. We got a zero to 60 there of 5.9 seconds. And I would attribute that to its snappy gear changes and really plentiful turbo torque down low. While it doesn't take off the line super fast, it does begin to pull hard pretty quickly. The dude bro in me says that this could pull off a properly quick low five second run if it had launch control. But at the same time, it's a crossover with a bed in the back. The more important piece of info is that this makes peak torque at 1700 RPMs. It passes with ease, the transmission is smooth, and it can tow 5,000 pounds with the turbo and trailer brakes. Naturally aspirated models can still lug 3,500 pounds. Interestingly, gas mileage for the turbo dual clutch shows no real downside to the normal engine, according to the EPA. Since this is very similar to the Hyundai Tucson, it will come standard with front wheel drive on the SE and SEL. 
However, you can option all-wheel drive for the base 2.5 liter engines. If you go up to the turbo, then you will get the H-Track all-wheel drive system as standard. So from what I've seen, it's a pretty good setup. It says it has like a locking function to it. All that does is just force the system to make sure that power is being sent to the rear wheels because otherwise it tends to be heavily front-wheel drive bias until it senses that it needs to send more torque to the rear. There's no limited slip differentials, no locking, but it will try to brake individual wheels to help send more torque to where it needs to go. Around the side of the Santa Cruz, you'll have 18 inch wheels on everything except for the Limited and some fun textured body cladding with an image of a little truck on there to really get you in the spirit. When it comes to features, I think jumping up to the SEL is worth it because you'll have proximity unlock and lock along with heated exterior mirrors. You can also get something called the activity package. which will include things like bed lighting, a 115 volt outlet, along with that nifty tonneau cover, roof rails, and a little rear window that's unfortunately not power. And that tonneau cover does require a little muscle to operate and isn't as watertight as the old camper shell on my Tacoma, but it's not meant to be slept in and it leaks at an acceptable rate for a tonneau cover in a car wash. You're definitely well into the $30,000 mark with that and all wheel drive, but it does help make this a pretty useful little truck. And yeah, the issue here is that it's obviously quite short. So we're looking at about 52 inches and it is wide enough here towards the top to accommodate for a four by eight sheet of whatever except the rear seats or the back here does not fold down like it you know did in the chevy avalanche uh, and the subaru baja obviously at 52 inches this kind of area is best used for things that you wouldn't want to put in the back of your suv or car so it's good for gardening little tools mountain bikes and maybe you can even get in something like a dirt bike just nothing too outrageous to make the best use of space my tester has movable bed cleats this is a helpful tie down feature as is the standard d-rings and the durable composite bed is nice to see as well there are a couple little cubbies here and a small in-bed trunk that you can stash backpack small luggage or use it as a cooler but it is nowhere near as spacious as what you'll find in the ridgeline whether we're looking at bed capacity or trunk capacity still i think this is plenty useful and is a great alternative to an suv and depending on your usage it could even substitute for a traditional mid-sized truck however response from a standstill reminds me why there are no other dual clutch pickups in north america yes it's not a jerky transmission for a dual clutch i found it to be very smooth but in doing so, there's so much delay, especially off the line. Maybe you're trying to, you know, take a left turn. Sometimes it feels like a couple seconds go by before the car is then like, oh, whoa. Notably, there's less delay in sport mode and it tends to react much better when at speed. It seems like it's a software thing that's going on, but it's frustrating nonetheless. Once you're up to higher speeds, the low end torque still does come in nicely and I really don't have any complaints. It's a well suited powertrain for this truck. You can get on it and it really does start to put you in the back of your seat. I haven't driven the Ford Maverick, but it does feel more spry than the Honda Ridgeline. And when it comes to merging up to highway speeds, the vehicle moves through the gears seamlessly. Cruising at 65 miles per hour, RPMs are about 1600. When it comes to road noise levels, it's not going to fool you into thinking that it is a luxury car. It's far from even approaching that, but for the price, considering the segment, I would call it adequate, not serene, and the interior kind of follows that same ideology. I really enjoyed the overall shape of the cabin, its layout, and the tech, but the material choice in some areas and the space is kind of disappointing. This is priced right around where the Hyundai Tucson is, so you'd expect them to cut some corners in certain areas. You do at least have reasonably soft rest points for your elbows, but there is very hard, cheap plastic where your knees might rest, and really just around the whole cabin. And they also took it back to 2015 with the just egregious use of piano black 
gloss plastic here and there's really not any buttons but everything else including the new night edition will have an eight inch screen with physical dials and buttons for the manual air conditioning setup the all capacitive setup for the higher trims has automatic dual zone hvac regardless everything that you touch just gets smudged gets dust pretty quickly however i'm at least glad that they put in a relatively snappy touch screen with good resolution, quick response time, and wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is standard, but oddly enough, not on the SEL Premium in Limited because the 10.3 inch screen apparently doesn't support it. So you do get another 10.3 inch screen along with a wireless charger. If you go with the activity package on the SEL and all these activity features do come on the SEL Premium and Limited as well. But I really do enjoy the digital gauge cluster here because it's configurable enough. There's some fun themes that you can play with and it responds nicely and I like how it's integrated into the dash. It's kind of minimalist. And I also like how the touchscreen here is oriented towards the driver. I also really like the steering wheel. It's a nice soft leather on everything except for the base and I enjoy its style and I enjoy the aesthetic of the whole interior. It kind of just swoops all around. And the seats too, they're comfortable. Unfortunately, they're cloth only until the limited trim which will get ventilated seats. SEL buyers get heated seats at least and lumbar adjustment. So again, I would go with at least the SEL. The build quality here is actually pretty good. You know, just grabbing the door handle here feels nice solid thud and the panel gaps are kept under reasonable control it just doesn't feel like a 35 40 thousand dollar crossover in here overall it seems like the limited trim is a big step in the upscale direction when it comes to features so maybe my opinion would change with that but it should at over 41 grand when it comes to speakers you'll have six standard with a bose setup coming on the limited trim considering my tester doesn't have a subwoofer bass is present and the high notes don't distort too easily i don't really have this big urge to jump up to the bose after listening to it with the front seat set up in a comfortable yet not excessive position for me at six foot three i can still fit back here my knees are pressed up here against the side of the seat and the materials do get worse. Everything that you touch back here is just a hard, cheap plastic. There's no rear seat vents, no charging ports, unless you go up to the limited trim. And there's not even a center armrest. Now this thing is 195 inches long, which definitely gives it a leg up over the Tucson. However, that really just benefits the butt end of things. At the very least, you do have good storage compartments, but when it comes to comfort in the back seat, this is just going to take the L, especially with the seat. Like, yeah, I have enough thigh support. The floor is actually reasonably low, but the lumbar is just kind of odd. I wouldn't want to be sitting back here for a long period of time. If you really want one of these car truck... If you really want a car truck thing for family duties, I would probably just recommend going with a Honda Ridgeline. But if your budget can't support that, the Ford Maverick has a slightly better backseat from my research and the Santa Cruz should suffice if you're willing to compromise. Something I would be happy to do after driving this on real roads. On rougher roads, the Santa Cruz also shines. I mean, it has a confident, very substantial SUV feel. It doesn't you know, come across like a body on frame truck. You wouldn't expect it to. There's some heft in the steering, especially in sport mode. And around these corners, getting disturbed midway through, it's honestly holding itself together nicely. The brakes too actually have a very nice feel to them. I want to point that out. They bite hard enough, yet it's still very easy to do a smooth stop. You take it over potholes or uneven broken pavement, and it just shrugs it off. It's not a soft boatish ride. It has a nice firmness to it. It's supple. Unless you're looking for the most plush ride out there, I would recommend this to someone who lives in an area with really bad roads. A little bit higher speeds around some nice corners. The first thing I find is that the steering is great. I mean, it, there's not a whole lot of feedback going on, but it is precise, very predictable, and honestly, much more natural than I was expecting from a Hyundai product. And I think when you combine that with pretty good visibility out the front, the windshield feels very close. It's kind of a fun little car to drive. It doesn't hide the fact that it's a 4,100 pound Hyundai, but it does have a playful personality. I think Mazda's 2.5 liter turbocharged engine has a little bit more refined sound and feel than this, but 
it's still quite good, a little bit on the raspy side. Now I'll put it into its manual mode. Hell, we'll even put it in sport, guys. Yeah, I mean, you can make corrections mid-corner, and yes, there's a little bit of body motion there, and it's not perfect, but for something that has a bed, this is very well composed and definitely better handling than it really needs to be. And the steering also requires little correction when you're traveling around highway speeds. While the driving dynamics are impressive, first year reliability has been far from perfect. Stalling, power cutting around 2,500 RPMs, and even transmission failure has been reported. It seems like it's mostly affecting the turbo dual clutch models, but it's not exclusive to that. There were also a couple of other miscellaneous complaints with things like the brakes and headlights on Santa Cruz forums and carcomplaints.com. Some also voiced concern about the retractable tonneau cover and a tendency to get clogged with debris, but that shouldn't be an issue if you clean it out like you should. Overall, these could be teething issues as some in the Santa Cruz forums mentioned that cars built in 2021 seem to be the problematic ones. Hyundai also shows promise through using direct and port fuel injection, which keeps their intake valves clean. Their switch to a wet clutch also should help with durability. And they do have some of the longest warranties out there on paper, but considering all of that and Hyundai's meh past the last 10 years, I wouldn't recommend this just yet if reliability is among your highest priorities. Hyundai also has very good adaptive cruise control and, and for 2023 if you step up to the SEL premium you'll get the stop and go adaptive cruise versus just the regular adaptive cruise and a few other goodies. They allow the Santa Cruz to use navigation and speed limit detection to make for more natural semi-autonomous driving. Again you also have blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert standard which is kind of a necessity because like I said visibility good out the front but it's actually pretty abysmal around back. The window there is quite small, so you're really just not getting a whole lot through looking over your shoulder, especially if you were short. Those come in addition to standard lane assist and autonomous braking, the norm for new cars now. But as a whole, the Hyundai Santa Cruz is a big departure from today's market. It's a unicorn like the old Subaru Baja, but with a different approach. It's still a competent handling, comfortable SUV with a practical bed, personality, and a boosted engine if you so desire. But it doesn't aim squarely for the outdoorsy utilitarian crowd like the Subi or the new Ford Maverick. It also doesn't walk a premium path or a super practical one. In the absence of a specific niche, I think it makes an interesting argument as not just a small crossover or Tucson with a bed, but a heavy duty Tucson. It's a regular compact CUV with an extra foot of length, available juggernaut of an engine, impressive towing, a multi-purpose cargo bed, and substantial on-road feel. In the process, it compromises interior refinement, space, and a little value. The Santa Cruz won't be for everyone. In fact, it won't be for most. But if you've always wanted a small SUV with character that could accommodate an ultra wide variety of lifestyles without sacrificing an ounce of athleticism, I'm having a hard time thinking of a better option. Just one question remains. What's your move, Subaru? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and help me take on the YouTube algorithm. If you want more, subscribe and hit the bell. And thank you to my very loyal patrons. I'll catch you in the next one.